Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest webinar in our series of presentations designed to help Kansas companies expand their exports. Today, we'll focus on an important subject for all companies, developing a workforce strategy. My name is Jeff Willis, and I am the director of the International Division here at the Kansas Department of Commerce. I'll be your MC for today's event. This session will be recorded and will be accessible via our website once it has been posted. We look forward to any questions you may have, so please don't hesitate to post them at any time in the chat box. Towards the end of the program, we will go over your questions and hopefully have some good answers for you. So again, don't hesitate to pose your questions at any time in the chat box. For our first speaker today, we're particularly fortunate to have my colleague here at the Kansas Department of Commerce, Mr. Mike Bean. Mike serves as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce overseeing workforce services, human resources, building services, and workforce AID for the Kansas Department of Commerce. Mike started with the agency in January 2007 as a regional director in Southeast Kansas in the Workforce Services Division. His current duties include oversight of all federal workforce programs and grants, in addition to the 23 workforce centers located across the state. Mike received a master's degree in education from Kansas State University, and prior to his career with the Department of Commerce, was an educator and administrator in both secondary and post-secondary institutions in Kansas. Well, we have a lot to cover, so I'm gonna pass the platform over to Mike so we can get us started. Thanks, Jeff. Um, appreciate everyone joining today and, and I think a very relevant topic is as we look at the economy of Kansas and also the labor market. But first, I want to reflect a little bit. Hopefully, um, I see a lot of folks joining from across the state. We had a wonderful basketball game last night. And as Jeff mentioned, um, I am a graduate, uh, both with a bachelor's and master's degree from Kansas State University, along with two kids who have completed their education there. So you can obviously tell which way my heart leans um, towards last night result, but I think any Kansas Kansan would agree that it was a wonderful game to watch and probably the blood pressure level up throughout the state last night was up pretty high when they went into overtime. So what a great what a great game to watch, regardless of of which fan base you're from. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining today and in a in a very relevant topic as we think about the Kansas economy to kind of frame some stuff from my aspect, um, thinking back a couple years when um, we were all engaged in the pandemic and trying to figure out how to work, how to engage, how to attract talent. Um, we quickly recovered out of that. Kansas was one of the one of the states that um, recovered from the pandemic and saw a quick recovery within the economy and also um, a quick launch to a very, very tight labor market. To put things in perspective, um, looking at last week's unemployment numbers, I think in the state of Kansas, we were about 5,500, so 5,500 individuals receiving unemployment benefits. That is a historic low and, and has been at historic lows for the past several months. Um, we also have um, more job openings across the state than we have in history. Um, just on our, our job board, kansasworks.com, we have a little over 65,000 jobs available. So you can kind of equate the, the number of jobs um, available for individuals who are unemployed. Um, and that has steadily trended um, upward um, as we recovered from the pandemic. I also want to reflect that roughly two years ago, two and a half years ago, the agency published the Framework for Growth, which was um, the first economic study for the state of Kansas and provide first economic study for the state of Kansas and um, since the late um, 1980s, um, put it in perspective, it, it's been roughly um, 30 years since uh, the last truly economic study on the state. But one of the things that was revealed in that, and I, I call it the talent pillar, um, is actually aligning our talent with jobs that we have here in Kansas. Um, 
I will be the first to admit, based on my experience, both in post-secondary and secondary education, Kansas does a great job educating people. Um, tremendous school system, um, whether that's our K through 12 system, our community colleges, our technical colleges, our universities, our private schools. We do a great job educating and training individuals. Uh, but unfortunately, we do just as equal job exporting that talent that we educate out of state. A very large percentage of our uh, educated individuals move out of state. Um, that may be likely for job opportunities, but in a lot of cases, it's to experience a different way of life, whether that's a big city, mountains, or oceans. Um, so we have to kind of think of that. How do we do a better job of keeping our talent here in Kansas? How do we do a better job of aligning um, our training and our, and our interests in our young adults to jobs that are available in Kansas? Also associated with the talent pillar and the framework for growth, there's a lot of synergy around work-based learning. For many of people, work-based learning means a variety of things. Um, that could be experiences, that could be internships, that could be apprenticeships, but at the core of it, it's exposing people to career opportunities or job opportunities here in Kansas. So I'll come back to that um, a little bit later. Um, also, as we think um, about our great educational system, I also want us to think uh, of, of, of a couple things. I call them the long game for talent and talent recruitment and retention, and I also call it the short game for talent recruitment and retention. Um, obviously, the short game is very challenging. Those companies across Kansas or sectors across Kansas, it doesn't matter if you're hospitality, lodging, healthcare, manufacturing, whatever it may be, um, just about every employer, um, every business in Kansas has a need for talent. Um, so that would be what I consider the short game. Are you making connections within the community? Are you part of the community as a whole? Are you engaged with your community or technical college system or your local USDE, USDE your K through 12 system to really attach that, attach your name and your jobs to the talent that's exiting those um, educational systems, whether that's a, a recently high school graduate or somebody graduating from a, a technical or community college or a university. Um, also, are you are, are employers engaged with um, the public workforce system? In our case in Kansas, it's called Kansas Works. Um, Jeff mentioned we have um, several locations throughout the state. We also have a way to engage virtually through the website kansasworks.com, not only to post your positions, but also to gain um, assistance in recruiting individuals and helping to align um, also with training and education. The other aspect, and I call this the long game. Um, so, and, and really, it's it's part of more of an engagement strategy from an from an employer standpoint. Um, our, I, me I mentioned this work based learning concept. Are you opening your facility for tours? Are you engaging um, within high school classrooms as guest speakers or offering tours of your facilities to high school, community, or technical college students? Um, maybe it's as far as providing scholarships at whatever level. Uh, maybe it's being involved in, in a um, career and technical education advisory council. Some way, looking at linkages, that some way you can make direct contact with that talent pipeline. And at whatever level of education um, you want to engage with, whether that's a bachelor's degree in engineering or a technical certification in advanced manufacturing, um, are you engaging your educational system at those exit points? Or even, even in some cases, having the ability to hire individuals um, prior to them completing a certification. Um, so the concept around work-based learning, I think, is really important, uh, and that's exposure. Um, that could be internships, uh, that could be apprenticeships, um, and keep in mind, apprenticeship is kind of an earn and learn model. Um, and a, within an apprenticeship, that individual would actually be an employee of the company, go through a related classroom instruction and on the job training through a series of structural um, competencies and at the end of or at the end of it, be it at a higher wage, but also at a at a higher level of skill. 
Uh, one thing I always like to throw out is as it relates to um, apprenticeships and we think about retention on average across the United States, there's about a 92% retention rate of employees who have gone through an apprenticeship program. Also to put that in further perspective within our own agency, we have two apprenticeship programs and we have experienced similar results with our retention rates in a lot of cases. And I'll, 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 when, I, when I say a lot, roughly about 60% of our um, individuals who complete apprentices move within the organizations to a more manager or manager type program, manager type role. So I want you to kind of think about that too. I mentioned a little bit about engagement and, and it's a great pleasure to have a good friend and a good colleague and a good partner in, in crime, so to speak, with me with us today, Dr. Greg Mosier from Kansas City, Kansas Community College. Um, as I think about employers looking at the, the long game, um, this is a great opportunity to engage with our higher education systems across the state. Greg's going to share with you, I'm sure, many examples of, of the programs and how community and technical college um, systems can deliver um, on, a, on a larger scale or a very targeted scale or a very customized scale. Um, but this is a great opportunity for business in general to create that linkage from, um, from your talent needs to, I'll call it a warehouse of talent within our community and technical college system, or even any schools, any school level across the state um, as far as engagement. Um, so when we think about the short, short game and talent recruitment, we have the immediate need, we have the, the want, the, the desire right now to fill positions, but I also think there's you know, just as equal value and putting efforts on that long game of engaging young adults or engaging people in their first couple years of, of, of higher education or certifications or whatever that may be to demonstrate that there's opportunities right here in their back door, opportunities right here in Kansas. And selfishly, part of part of the theory is let's keep those folks here in Kansas. Let's, let's align them with great careers, great opportunities um, so that they can have the same experiences that you and I have had living and working and playing in Kansas. So um, again, Jeff, I appreciate the opportunity and I'll turn it back over to you to, to introduce Dr. Mosier. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm sure the audience appreciated all your comments. Don't hesitate to get back in touch with Mike uh, in the future if you feel the need to do so. He's very accessible and clearly has a wealth of uh, information about this subject. Well, our next speaker is Dr. Greg Mosier. Dr. Mosier has served in higher education in community college and university settings for almost 30 years. He previously served as Vice President of Academic Affairs at Oklahoma State University Institute of Technology before later becoming Vice President of Academic Affairs and Executive Vice President uh, Academic Affairs at Rochester Community and Technical College in 2015. Then in, in 2018, he became President of Kansas City, Kansas Community College, where he continues today. Beyond his educational experiences, which are many, Greg has worked in the private sector, working for organizations such as NASA, Rockwell International, DynCorp, Technologies International, EduSystems Inc., and the Consortium for International Development. Work for these groups included Department of Defense contract work in the United States and community college development, establishment, and instructor training for World Bank projects and the ministries of education in Yemen, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia. So with that, I would now like to invite, invite Dr. Greg Mosier to address our audience. Well, well, thank you, Jeff, for that very kind introduction. Um, and Assistant Secretary Beam, thank you for inviting me to uh, do this uh, presentation with you. Um, I've put together a little bit of a presentation, but as Jeff mentioned, uh, I, I do come from business and industry. So as I started in higher education, I continued that model as if it is, is a business. And, and from teaching students in the classroom through the administration, I really run the college as a as a business model and, and really can relate to the 
the work and the challenges and, and the successes that you are all having. So I've put together a little presentation. So um, Jeff, if you don't mind, we'll go ahead and get that started. Well, thank you. Um, I'll run through it and happy to answer any questions that you have um, as we go through at the end of the presentation. So um, to me, developing a workforce strategy, it's all about partnerships. And I, you know, I think Mike touched on that very well. So uh, you know, I have here our math equation, P3 equals W3. So we all know P3 is public-private partnerships and I'll hit the W3 later in the presentation. Um, this image that you're seeing behind the blue is a $62 million public-private partnership to open up a site with very specific technical programs on the east side of Wyandotte County, right in the urban core of Kansas City, Kansas community, uh, or Kansas City, Kansas. Um, today, we, to date, we've raised $45 million of the $62 million that we're anticipating. Uh, so it's going to be another great opportunity for for you to uh, reach out to us and help us help you with some trained individuals for your positions. All right, let me see what happened here. Okay. Apologize. Let me just go through this one more time. Apparently, I was on the ending slide. Terrible mistake for a techie, huh? Um, so, I, as you can see, we work with the Department of Commerce quite a bit. Um, the image down below is the uh, uh, business attraction that I participated with, with Commerce, uh, Assistant Secretary Bean, uh, Lieutenant Governor Toland, um, and, and several others from Commerce to uh, attract Panasonic here. And now we're working to provide a workforce for them. Just a little bit of background on KCKCC. Uh, we turn 100 years old this year. Um, and when I got here in 2018, I did an economic impact study so that we could really demonstrate the value that we bring. Um, in that study, one out of every 50 people in our service region has been supported by the work of KCKCC. And we've taken our annual budget that we receive um, and turned that into during that year $182 million in um, added income and impact. Uh, kind of a neat little example. It's the similar uh, I income of hosting 24 World Series. So at that time, about 770 employees, a payroll of about $39 million. Um, when you look at the direct economic, long-term, and social gains, that $115 million invested in us uh, at the state level turns into $665 million dollars of impact. So, you know, why we're here today, um, as was uh, discussed, we really need to work together and see how we can help grow the workforce and the, the you know, eliminate that skills gap in the positions that we have available. This is just Wyandotte County. Uh, we work very closely with Wyandotte Economic Development Council and their staff. So we can stay really current on what the job openings are. This image is a little, a uh, little bit older than some of the other ones we have, but it, it's a great visual for what's going on in Wyandotte County. Uh, we partner with Mark Kansas Manufacturing Solutions Workforce Partners Partnership and a tremendous amount of individual companies to help meet their needs, um, but really adds to what the college can do is working with Commerce and Kansas Works to help provide funding to businesses and industry and also students so that they can go through the different training programs that we have all the way from two year programs to very short term certificates. Um, we'll touch on programs that are uh, help funded by workforce aid. We work with uh, we owe it quite a bit. Um, 
in helping out our students financially afford college um, and getting more engaged in the apprenticeship model and the Office of Apprenticeship that, that now resides in Commerce. I just throw this slide together. It's uh, some of the companies that we work with. Of course, it's not all inclusive, uh, but you can see we serve a wide range of industries. Um, something I'll share with, uh, with Kat at the end of the presentation, and she'll be able to share with you as well as I'm happy to share the presentation, is a study that was just released by the Harvard Business School through their uh, Managing the Future of Work group called the Partnership Imperative, uh, Community Colleges, Employers, and America's Chronic Skills Gap. Now, I've been a skills gap person for 20 years. Uh, fully believe that it's a, it's a concern for us as a country and, and how do we help uh, shorten that skills gap. Now, um, the report was not glowing, um, but it, it was a very comprehensive report and it really talks about how colleges and employers really need to reboot and expand our partnerships to make it so that we can create a better employee for you. Uh, right now across the country, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges that we need to meet. Millions of vacant positions um, throughout, the, throughout the country. Uh, you know, um, Mike was talking about the number of jobs currently open in Kansas, in Wyandotte County through the YEDC, uh, the last jobs EQ report was there are 9,600 open jobs in Wyandotte County. Um, that's up quite a bit from some of our previous numbers. Uh, but this study, it's really, it's an exhaustive study. It took multiple years and identified some very specific actions that working together as a P3, we can help meet your uh, workforce needs. So some of the things that they came up with, there were really three goals that came out of this study. Uh, of course, number one is, is partnering with each other so that we ensure that the education, the technical training, the hands-on work, the, the labs work, the internship work is really in, in line with industry needs. Um, coming from business and industry, I get that. And that's really where I focus a lot of time on. The other thing is, uh, real world learning on the on the job training and as we call learn and earn uh, very much like apprenticeships and the different models. Um, it recommends that we really work more closely together on the recruiting and hiring of students and that graduate from our programs, whether it's a certificate or an associate's degree. We really have to align much better um, so that you are aware when these individuals become available and through the work with you on curriculum development and you know support with equipment or supplies materials financial support that um, we can also get these students jobs when they graduate in today's current economy um, it's really not hard to get them jobs uh, there's often a lot of competition for the graduates that we have um, and then really making those decisions based on supply and demand. And that's why the partnerships with um, Commerce, uh, with uh, Wyandotte Economic Development Council and others in business and industry um, are important that we really have and we're working on the latest data. Um, part of the, honestly, the problems, the frustration with business and industry that they have with um, colleges and more so with universities, uh, but even with community colleges are that we just we're not sending them out there with the exact skills that they need to hit the ground running when they come to you um, and working together we can help solve that. So this really is it's a it's a new era for workforce edu education. We've been doing customized training in a traditional manner for years and years and years. Um, but we're looking at expanding and what we're doing is actually what Harvard found that 
colleges and industry need to do. Um, but to touch on some of the offerings, we have full two-year degree offerings um, in um, Associate of Arts, Associate of Science, and then our technical programs in Associate of Applied Science degrees. We have short-term certificates. So we'll have a maybe a 16 or a 30 credit hour short-term college certificate. We, we call that Certificate A. And then we'll have a Certificate B. And then we'll have a, cert, uh, the Certificate C, which is also leads to an associate degree. So this gives your workers the opportunity or uh, potential workers to come get trained, get some skill sets so that they can go out and start working and then they can return to continue on whatever that academic technical path is for them. Um, because the long, the long game and the short game, uh, as Mike mentioned, we really want to make sure that we meet your needs but as a college, we're also looking out for what's in the best interest and in, for the long term for students. Um, and we all know the way that a lot of the systems work. It's uh, if they want to advance off the floor and, and get into the different offices and management, um, and a, a degree does help with that. Uh, embedded apprenticeships, we'll talk about that more later um, and what we're doing with the Office of Apprenticeship. Um, and one of the new things that has been here for a while, but it's gaining momentum, are the micro credentials. Um, they can be both credit and non credit, and we'll dig into that a little bit later as well. From the, the college perspective and how we can work together, together with business and industry, uh, there's a couple models that I've worked with quite a bit. Uh, when I was VP um, at the technology campus for Oklahoma State University, we had two primary programs. Uh, one is a company supported or an OEM supported model. A lot of people think about they can uh, understand it quickly. That's automotive technology programs. You know, there's a, um, a GM program, a Dodge, a Chevy, a Toyota program that trains students specifically for working on those vehicles um, from those OEMs, um, and those are really heavily supported by those OEMs. We had those, we had, uh, along with automotive, we had diesel, we have Caterpillar, Komatsu, Greco, uh, you know, the list goes on, a lot of natural gas. Uh, and then the other, which is actually more affordable um, for our business partners is a consortium supported model. So I'll, I'll use OSU IT as a, a other example in the natural gas compression field. We had multiple companies that work in that sector that came together to help support the program and buy equipment and scholarship students um, so that they could graduate. The, the bill was a lot more uh, uh, consumable by, by the business and industry because you can split it 30 different ways, uh, however many are in your consortium. And then the other thing is really beginning those conversations early and, and as soon as possible. Um, working with, uh, with commerce and the uh, Y.EDC, uh, you know, we're very involved in business attraction. So, you know, the Panasonic is a great example. Um, Urban Outfitters is a, another example. Uh, we have a new company that's just moving um, into Wyandotte County um, that's otherwise fairly local. Um, Orange GV, they make the, um, the, the yard trucks to move containers around and such. It's all electric. They started it from scratch. We're, they're not here yet, but we're already developing a curriculum built off of courses that we already have existing, but then they will have some specific courses for Orange GV that they need to help build their, uh, their trucks here. Um, so doing that as soon as possible, you know, an another uh, project, uh, it's called Premier 2 is the project name. Uh, we're doing the same thing. They're not here yet, but you know we are working to help develop a curriculum for them. Uh, many other examples like that. Um, flexibility is key, definitely. 
some of the other models that we're working with um, on the consortium level uh, is we're working with a statewide association that has a huge uh, job opening number. So as an association, they're kicking in a certain dollar amount to help offset the faculty cost uh, because technical faculty can cost more than uh, gen ed faculty. So they're helping us with that. Um, it, for businesses to really understand so that it's like we're, we're not just coming to you to because we just want extra money. Um, mm -hmm. As I explain it, we're we're not we are a not for profit, but we're also not for loss, right? So help us break even, and and that's our goal. So that's the that's the W three. It's a it's a win win win. So it's a win for our business partners. Uh, to get you trained uh, candidates. Uh, it's a win for the students who can go into a lot of the high paying jobs that all of you offer. And I saw the invite list, so it's great to see that. Um, and it's a win for the college because we can just, if we break even, we can continue to serve and, and offer those programs. Um, and flexibility, uh, you know, we're, we're doing different things with different companies or industry sectors because we want to build something that is right for you. Okay. Um, so the FAME, FAME is the Federation of Advanced Manufacturing Education. We started a Kansas FAME chapter and a KC FAME. We are the only FAME institution in the state of Kansas, in the state of Missouri, and all around. And this is all around advanced uh, automation engineering technology, advanced manufacturing. Um, so this is a, a industry supported consortium. Uh, here are some of our, these are our current members. Um, what they do is we just have to make sure we have enough seats filled that we can pay our faculty and our technicians and such. Um, so they commit to, to uh, the, the purchase of a certain number of seats. To help us get to that break-even point, you know, and they they fill them, so that's not a problem. We work with them too. Um, if they don't have enough for a year, and we can bring someone off the street, we'll fill that seat if, with their approval because this is really their program. We offer it, um, and then financially that helps them as well too. Um, it's an embedded apprenticeship model model. It's not yet registered, but with what um, Commerce has done and what the governor's uh, trying to do with apprenticeship is huge. Um, there's been money that's been a, uh, in the governor's request for the Office of Apprenticeship. So we're working with um, Shonda Atwater there with our current companies and how can we help them because that, that can help fund some of the training we're doing there. Um, in these types of, in this relationship especially, um, this we don't select the students or the students don't self-select. They're actually selected by the members of that association who will send them, uh, people who are already working for them, and they want to skill them up to get to that next level. They might be um, industrial maintenance, maintenance techs, but they have that aptitude. So the company will send them and then they'll come out with these advanced um, engine automation engineering uh, skill sets. So we do Monday and Tuesday in class and labs here at the college, um, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it's their apprenticeship work. They go back to the company and we have that curriculum built that they need to cover certain items in the in the existing curriculum. It's earn and learn. The students can graduate, get these skill sets um, and not have any college debt. A shorter term program, industrial maintenance tech. It's something that we've been doing. I think we're on our seventh cohort now. Um, you can see the courses. Uh, those are college level courses that are offered on the right. We do it in the evenings, Monday through Thursday. So a lot of these individuals are incumbent workers as well. Um, so if you have someone that's doing general work and they, again, they have that aptitude in 14 weeks, they can get these skill sets in these categories 
Um, and they'll also move from whatever their current pay is to probably around fifty, fifty-five thousand dollars a year. Um, we ensure that our programs, uh, we want them to get college credit, even if it's credit for prior learning or their apprenticeship work, so that they can help that have that to help them in the future. So, um, uh, workforce at AID helps, and they pay fifty percent of the tuition cost for these students, um, and it's it's a great way to to get people in your uh, areas here in a very short time period, and we can do this in other areas as well, along with maintenance tech. Uh, and then really kind of the last thing, um, which is growing in recognition, is the micro uh, cred credentialing. Those are industry recognized certificates. Yeah, you know, I, I dropped this one in as an example um, in the IT sector, and, and I know we have a lot of uh, representatives from the IT sector on the call today, so it's great to see. This is a really, a lot of people know about this, the Cisco certification. So they start off with a CCNA. Um, they get a college degree with that as well, so they get both, um, you know, and then they go to the specialist, and then CCN, CCNP, CCEI, IE. All of those certificates or credentials, industry knows what they are. They know exactly what those students are capable of doing because they know what those um, uh, certificates represent. And then the micro pathways are stackable micro credentials, right? So uh, people can continue to expand their skill sets in, the, in these areas. Um, I just threw these two companies up. They're uh, pretty well recognized across the country. Um, we, the college would offer the courses. We were not a certified Cisco, uh, Cisco certified um, exam center. So we would send them to one of those to, to get that. But as a company, if you can help pay for them uh, to take that test, maybe it's $150, but that's just out of their reach right now. Um, it's a win-win again. So, uh, you know, that is kind of a lot of the things that we are doing. Uh, we're doing some really innovative work here at the college. Um, and so see how we're doing on time. Um, I will just uh, we'll turn it over to, to Jeff and move on to the next topic. So thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure presenting to you today. Well, Greg, thank you very much. And uh, certainly, Mike, uh, thank you as well. But uh, listening to what you had to present, Greg, uh, I learned so much about what is available for companies uh, here in the state. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, I would expect regionally as well. Uh, I was particularly uh, uh, struck by uh, your embedded apprenticeships uh, description uh, and the FAME program. Um, I, I'm going to sort of kick off the questions here uh, with uh, a very general question, and uh, maybe I'll throw this uh, to you, uh, Greg, and that is, uh, how does a company begin the process of being able to talk with you folks about uh, embedded uh, apprenticeships uh, and or other ways in which uh, they can partner up with you for the development of skills that are going to be very specifically oriented uh, towards uh, their particular uh, company. Sure. Greg, I'll throw that to you first. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I'll put my um, contact information on the uh, last slide in the um, in the deck, uh, but feel free to shoot me an email and we can talk about what you're looking for, and then we would bring in um, the appropriate dean, our vice president for academic affairs, and those um, in these industry sectors um, have that initial conversation. But we need to understand what your wants, wishes, and desires are, and then we can look at what we have in existing curriculum, um, or if there is enough demand that we would build additional courses for it so it's just sustainable over time uh, we're really open to that as well um, in the meantime we could be doing um, customized training right so customized training is typically non-credit uh, at most institutions we do both credit and non-credit 
Um, but as we if we do it non credit and we're developing coursework in that area, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation around EV. Then once we get it into our college catalog, we can go back and assign college credit for that too. So I would say um, shoot me an email. Let me know uh, what your interest is. Um, I'll put together a, a small team from administration and the appropriate uh, division, and uh, we can just start having those conversations. And that's really how it, how it starts is sitting down and uh, tell us what your needs are. We tell you what we have, what we currently have, and, and how we can help meet those needs. Wow. Uh, well, that certainly uh, sounds like uh, you've got a very flexible approach. And the first step begins with uh, beginning that communication uh, with the company that may have an interest in following up. Uh, Mike, is there anything you want to add to uh, this particular uh, area of discussion before I move on? Yeah, yeah, just to kind of follow up on some of the comments that, that Greg had made. Um, I think creating that partnership between industry and the organization that will provide that technical training and in Greg's example, obviously, Kansas City, Kansas Community College. I'm going to drop in the chat also um, Shonda Atwater, who's leading our efforts um, within the Office of Apprenticeship. I'll drop her email address in there if you want to make a connection. Obviously, if you're on the western side of Kansas, Gray or Kansas City, Kansas Community College may not be the best fit, but we can make connections to other um, education or training providers out there that can assist or help with the creation of an, an apprenticeship program. So I'll drop that in the chat, Jeff. Yeah, great. I went ahead and dropped my email in the chat as well. Great. Well, I encourage anyone uh, to be able to go to the chat as well. Uh, if you have any particular questions uh, that you want me to pose uh, to uh, either of our speakers, this is your chance to do so. Uh, I see we've got a number of people from uh, both uh, private sector uh, companies uh, as well as economic development organizations and others. Right now in the state of Kansas, uh, I think Mike uh, talked very uh, uh, clearly about the uh, level of employment that we're having and the fact that uh, there is uh, a great interest among uh, many parties to be able to uh, look forward to uh, bringing in some increase in their workforce. And as you said, there's both a short term play as well as a long term play. And so uh, as people examine this, uh, I'd be very curious to know what they may think uh, are some of the challenges that they have and some of the areas where they might be able to take advantage of some of uh, what's being offered here today. Jeff, yeah, if we drop into a lull in questions, I can uh, I can visit a little bit or speak to workforce aligned with industry demand if that helps. The I think that's great. Why don't you go ahead and do that now, and then we'll wait for a couple of those uh, questions to come in. Thanks, Jeff. So. Yeah. Um, Greg even mentioned in his presentation the workforce aid or workforce aligned with ind industry demand, which is a, a training program or training assistance program operated through the agency, the Department of Commerce. Um, in a sense, it's a customized training program designed specific to entry level or advancements within an organization, but it, it's it's. It's a it's a package that can help offset the costs of training. Um, it does require an industry match. Um, I think it's currently 50% match, um, but it does allow um, the, the specialized or individualized or customized training um, leading to employment. Um, so it would be a partnership between the agency, the business slash employer, um, the workforce system as part of the recruitment um, piece to that. But um, uh, while, while we're waiting for questions, I'll also um, drop Tyson Winningham's um, email into the chat, and Tyson would be the primary contact um, to gain additional information about workforce aid. Obviously, um, Dr. Mosier at Kansas City, Kansas Community College would be able to make those connections um, also. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're, as you're looking at that talent pipeline. Maybe you've identified a population or or individuals um, within your sector, and it makes sense to do some um, pre-employment type training or certifications. Um, the workforce aid um, program could could obviously help offset some of those costs, along with 
um, the Kansas Industrial Training um, grant opportunities through the agency, which are for net new employees, or the Kansas Industrial Retraining Program, uh, which would be for existing employees that um, are needing reskilled or retooled or certified on new equipment or new processes would be an opportunity to help, help offset some of those training costs. And I'll drop a couple contact information in the chat um, for those programs too. Uh, thanks, Mike. If I could just add on to that real quick. Um, we, there's also the WIOA funding for, you know, that our students would be directly eligible to receive if they're kind of in, in those uh, uh, economic need category. Uh, so we're currently looking at, as an example, we're currently uh, developing a high voltage, kind of a pre-apprenticeship program because we know once they get these certain skill sets from us, they still need to go through the apprenticeship program, whether it's with the unions or the public utility company or some of the, the regional rural companies. Um, and currently, uh, to receive financial aid, a program has to be at least uh, 16 credit hours long or a certain number of contact hours. Um, so those programs that are shorter currently, like the, the INT, but we're adding some more classes to it. So to get to that 16 credit hours, then the students would be eligible for federal financial aid that you probably know as the Pell Grant. Um, Pell Grant went up to $7,350, I believe, for a, cal for a year for the students. Um, our tuition is about 100 bucks an hour. Um, so with that, it helps pay for all the tuition. Um, but working with uh, Workforce AID or WIOA, they can help offset some of those funds and that would help the students be able to use some of their Pell money um, for living expenses and things as, as well. So uh, pulling this high voltage program together, uh, you know, we had Tyson with us and a representative from uh, WIOA and others so that the, the companies can understand what help they might be able to receive financially. So again, our, our our big deal is P3. We bring everyone to the table and sit down and and see how we can make these programs uh, happen at the you know the best value set for the companies, the college, and and the students. Well, thank you. Uh, I believe this question uh, you may have uh, just answered this, uh, Dr. Mosier, but. Uh, I'm going to, in the interest of uh, responding to the one question we have in the chat room, let me go ahead and pose it. Uh, it's from Teresa, and she says, even with grants available, a limit of $6,000 per person, the overall cost of uh, a, an AA degree with technical college and wages is over $50,000 cost uh, to the employer. Are there other ways to reduce this cost? And again, I believe you've touched upon some of those, but I'll pose it more broadly to see if there are other uh, answers that we might be able to offer, either from you, uh, Greg, or from you, uh, Mike. Sure. Um, so I'm not sure where the $50,000 comes from or what college they might be working with, um, but it's not anything near that from with what we do. Um, that may, those may be specialized, customized training courses that a, a premium is being paid. Um, a, a, um, an associate degree is 60 credit hours. If you multiply that times, you know, $100, we're looking at $6,000. Um, so it's kind of a long ways away from 50. Even with uh, books and materials, you know, let's say you add another $3,000 to it. Um, I think our average cost per student, um, excluding housing, is around $8,000. So maybe we can connect and um, talk about what some of those needs are and, and how we might be able to look at some different financial structures, or I can sh share a little bit more information about some of the cost models that we're looking at, but it's just not near that. Mike, do you have anything you want to add before we move on? Um, I, you know, if it, if the, you know, I would I would agree with Greg's comment. You know, making a connection with the education or training provider to see what those actual costs may be, but also 
there's an opportunity to take advantage of many of the things that we've talked about as far as grants or programs that could help offset those costs. Uh, I don't know, many, many times, and in, in I've been guilty of this, is looking at whether you call it professional development from your existing staff for continuous improvement or continuous skill gain, um, you know, taking a, a step back and looking at it from an investment standpoint, investing in your in your company or your industry. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, retention rates go up as you invest in your in your employees and invest not only pay and wage wise obviously is important, but also investing in them so that they can improve their their skills also. Thank you. Well, uh, we don't have any other questions specifically uh, in the chat box, but uh, obviously uh, both of you have provided uh, additional information in terms of contact information, uh, as well as some uh, suggestions relative to some other programs and some other individuals who may be of interest to our audience as they look at this whole subject of uh, workforce training. Uh, I, I also know that uh, from my own experience with webinars such as this, that uh, folks on this call may want to go back and review some of the information that's been presented here today. Uh, for that reason, we record these sessions and we make them available on our website, uh, kansascommerce.gov, uh, so that you can go ahead and review some of the information that's been put forward and come forward with any other questions you may have uh, to uh, either our speakers or certainly any of us on our team, we'd be happy to put you in touch with the appropriate folks. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank again uh, both of our uh, presenters here today uh, for giving us some insight into some of the uh, available resources for Kansas companies as they look to be able to meet some of the challenges associated with ensuring that they have a uh, educated and productive workforce uh, going forward, not just for uh, their current needs, but obviously for the needs uh, that they think they're going to be looking to in the future, uh, particularly as we expand the economic base here in the state uh, to welcome more advanced manufacturing and more manufacturing uh, that requires uh, higher levels of uh, skills and uh, education among the workforce. So again, thank you very much uh, to our presenters and thank you to the audience for uh, sticking around and, and listening to this session. We look forward to welcoming you again uh, for our next month's uh, presentation. Uh, there'll be announcements uh, coming forward for that. We try to keep them timely. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll let you know uh, as we move forward with that again. So with that, I'd like to bring this uh, current webinar to a close and thank everybody for their participation.